Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining today's Aberdeen University Little Lecture. Uh, what I'm going to do just to to give you uh, an overview of the plan. So I'm Sean Treewick. I'm a health services researcher here at the University of Aberdeen, and I'm really interested in randomised trials. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'll talk for about 20 minutes. There will then be time at the end for questions and answers. So hopefully we can have a nice Q&A at the end. And of course, it's recorded as these things are. So there will be something to watch uh, later on or indeed send to your friends uh, afterwards if they weren't able to join us. So as I've said, I'm interested in randomised trials. I'll tell you what they are in a moment, uh, but I'm really interested in making sure that those trials are as useful and relevant as they can be to all the people who could potentially benefit from the medicines and initiatives and treatments that those trials evaluate. So let's start with how do we know if something works? So let's imagine we have a new drug or a new way of talking to people with particular problems about that problem to help them through it. Or in this case, the picture that's up on screen right now is a little camera that you could swallow. It would go through your digestive system, taking hundreds of thousands of photographs and could be used as a way to look for bowel cancer or signs of future bowel cancer. So it's a little uh, cancer screening tool. Now, it sounds fabulous, a nice piece of kit. But the question is, how do we know if this piece of kit does what we want it to do? Does it actually help us to detect bowel cancer? Is it better than what we do now? Is it at least as good as what we do now, but might have some other advantages? And that is a very, very common question in the health service. Does this new idea this new initiative work? Is it better than what we're doing right now? And for that sort of question, the best way of answering it is to do something called a randomised trial. And there's a clue there in the name as to one of the key features of this type of evaluation, the randomization part. And the problem we have when thinking about does something work is, well, there are lots of things that might influence the thing we're interested in measuring. So we want to test something because we want to see whether it improves people's quality of life or reduces their pain or helps them walk a little bit better or perhaps prevents them from dying. So that's the outcome. And there are potentially lots of things that might influence it. And we don't know what all of those things are. We can never predict what all of them are. That's what the randomization element does for us because it randomly decides who goes into our new treatment and who gets our current treatment or an alternative treatment. Does that randomly. So it spreads whatever those things are that might influence our outcome. Let's say it's pain spreads that equally across all of our groups. And that is a wonder. We don't have to then concern ourselves as to whether the groups are equivalent, whether it's a fair test of our new treatment because the randomization does that for us as, as long as we do it properly and let's not talk about the details but the basic idea is that randomization allows us to spread things we know about and things we don't know about that might influence the outcome across all of our groups and it, it's a, a magical way of testing a new treatment or indeed of course an existing treatment and trials are very very important they are right at the heart of healthcare systems like the National Health Service here in the UK, and they do change lives. So for many of the treatment decisions that people in the hospitals and healthcare systems, wherever you are based, many of those decisions will be leaning on, making use of information that has come from randomized trials. They are really central. So what's not to like? Now, bear with me on this one. If you imagine that you are a patient or if you're a healthcare professional or you're a policymaker thinking, should we provide this particular treatment modality in our region, then you have questions and you have a picture in your head of what information you need. So if somebody's going to test this thing, does it work? You have a picture in your head of what you need to enable you to answer your question well. You, you know things like, well, I want to, this treatment compared to this. This is what we're doing right now. I want it compared 
to that. I want it to be done in primary care GP practices. I want it to involve these sorts of people. I'm really interested in the impact this treatment has on pain and mobility. These are the things that are in those people's head. That's the picture. Let's imagine it looks like a vase of flowers. That's what I was saying. Bear with me. It's about a picture. That's the picture they have in their head. The problem is that very often what they get is that. Now, it's not quite a dog's dinner, but it is a dinner. It's not a vase of flowers. So there's a mismatch between what those users of the trial information need to help them answer their questions and what the researchers deliver. They deliver something different. And of course, that is then much less useful to them. So let's start thinking about why that might be. So one of the key things for making decisions about whether this information is useful to me or not, if you're a patient or a healthcare professional policymaker, is who is in the trial? Now, randomised trials have something called eligibility criteria. What sort of person do we want in our trial if we're testing this treatment or initiative? Generally, these eligibility criteria are clinical. OK, we're, we're doing a treatment in diabetes for example, and the person with diabetes uh, can't have this condition and this condition as well. Those are the sorts of things. It might be uh, questions about weight. So we have these criteria and you would look at a person and say, OK, well, that person has diabetes, but they have this as well and we can't have them in our trial. So that's how we make decisions currently about how people get into our trial. We use eligibility criteria. Having decided who's in your trial in terms of the eligibility criteria, you now have a very, very important decision, which is how many? How many people do we need in the trial? And that decision is based to a very great extent on statistics and it drives all of your work. So let's say, having talked to the statisticians and thinking about what you want to achieve with your trial, then you come up with a number and that number is a thousand. And that's completely normal. Uh, for many, many trials, you need a thousand people in your trial, something like that. Now, once you've started the trial, we researchers like myself have a great tendency to focus on the 1,000. We need a thousand, we need a thousand, we need a thousand. And we keep watching that number and that can lead to a problem. And that problem is dependent on exactly who the thousand people are. And it's linked to something which uh, I tend to call applicability. Essentially, can you take the results from the trial and apply them to the situation where those decision makers, the patients, the healthcare professionals, policy makers are based so that your research evidence has something to say to them and help them? And if you imagine we were thinking about who is in the trial, if a patient asked the question, uh, so doc, do these results apply to me? And the research itself has involved no one or almost no one who looks like them, has the same sort of background, has the same sort of conditions, et cetera, et cetera, then it's hard for that doctor to say, well, yes, they do, because we don't actually have any sense from the research as to whether people like your patient would find this treatment to be of benefit. And I'll start giving you a few examples now. So this is uh, pretty recent data from something called the COVID-19 Vaccine Research Register, so UK register of COVID research, not just uh, sorry, COVID vaccine research, not just trials, but all types of vaccine research linked to the coronavirus. And they produce a dashboard, which is this picture over on the right. And you can see that there are about getting on for half a million volunteers. And that's great. There's a lot of people. But look over here, which what they produce. And this is around ethnicity. And then this is a topic uh, I'm going to talk about quite a lot now. So if we were thinking of a group of individuals who looked like the UK as a whole, then the percentages next to those volunteers would look like the percentages in the community as a whole. And at the top we can see we've got white and that says 92 and a half percent. Now the UK population is about 80 percent white. So what we're seeing immediately is that in this uh, database, if you like, of COVID vaccine studies, the people who are involved, there are more white people in those studies than we would expect from the population as a whole. 
And if we go through some of those ethnic groups, and I'm going to focus on one here, which is the Black African Caribbean or Black British, that 0.6 should really be something like three and a half. Um, so th that's a, a enormous underrepresentation of people from those ethnic groups in research being done on the COVID-19 vaccines. And that is an issue because, of course, as we're all well aware by now, that different ethnic groups are affected in different ways, have been disproportionately affected for some of the ethnic minority groups by COVID compared to, in the UK, the white majority population. So what this says is that the research is not really reflecting the community as a whole, the people who could benefit from vaccines and other treatments. It's not representing the whole community, it's over-representing part of it. And when we think about the COVID-19 vaccines in particular, uh, you'll have also, many of you, I guess, heard about vaccine hesitancy, some reluctance to take the COVID-19 vaccine. And one known contributor to vaccine hesitancy amongst ethnic minority groups is, well, do these results apply to me? And it being difficult to give a convincing answer because the research itself has not involved so many individuals like them. So it, it, it makes it very hard to say yes in many situations. So what we want is our research to reflect everybody in the community who has something to gain if that treatment or initiative is effective. In other words, trials need to be more inclusive. So the trial team, people like me, need to think beyond the we need a thousand people and think more about, OK, we need a thousand people. But within those thousand, who do we really need to make sure is in our trial for those results to apply to the people whose decisions we are trying to support? And just to make sure I don't forget, I have been concentrating on ethnicity here, but th there are many, many other groups. We could think of older people, the very young, uh, people who, from more socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, uh, people who are pregnant. There are a lot of groups of individuals who historically have not been particularly well represented in trials. And, and this has been recognised for some time. So in here in the UK, the biggest public funder of health research is an organisation called the National Institute for Health Research, NIHR. And in 2017, they initiated an initiative called INCLUDE. And that was all about addressing this problem. We recognise that our research does not always reflect the community as a whole. It doesn't always involve the people it really should involve, given the people who can benefit. And that project was called INCLUDE. And it's a very broad initiative. It's looking at all groups that have traditionally, historically not been well represented in research. And the INCLUDE project calls those groups the underserved. It's a really good expression, which they uh, develop together with people from underserved groups. So INCLUDE is very broad. And what I got involved with, with colleagues from across the UK and Ireland, in fact, was to take on one part of that, which is something called the Include Ethnicity Framework. So Include as a whole is interested in all underserved groups. And what this tool is focusing on is ethnic minority groups in particular, and, in, and indeed really ethnic groups, all of them. So we want people to think about which ethnic groups should be in our trial. And it boils down to some key questions and some worksheets to help people answer those questions well. And I'll give you uh, some examples of those. But these are the four key questions. And one of the things I always like to emphasize about this, is this is not rocket science. Right? We've not invented some new magical uh, way of designing trials. We've, we're just asking people to ask themselves questions. And those questions are, they're not radically off at a tangent. They are, you know, bang on the money. They're the sorts of questions we should have been asking for a long time. So these four key questions, these are actually very general. They're not only focused on the ethnic groups that you would like in your trials. The first question uh, looks obvious, but anyway, here it is. Who should be in your trial? And what we're thinking here is, given the disease, let's say it was diabetes, given that disease and the people who get that disease, where do our people need to come from, our participants? So we might need a thousand of them, but is it perhaps 
possible that some groups, maybe some ethnic minority groups, for example, are more likely to get that disease than others or might get it uh, to a greater severity, for example. Uh, who bears the burden of the disease? Who has most to gain from a better treatment? So we want trialists to think about more than the thousand and who should be in the trial across other groups? Is it people perhaps who are more socioeconomically disadvantaged? Is there something about that group? Uh, that means we really, really, really need to have them in our trial. So having identified the groups of individuals who need to be in the trial, we want people to then think, right, OK, great. Will those people or some of them respond differently to the treatment and that will make it hard for them to get involved? And what we're thinking here is it may well be that the disease itself, the, the area in which you're offering a treatment might be problematic or more problematic for some groups than others and in a moment I'm going to talk about an in vitro fertilization example linked to infertility. So you could imagine infertility uh, is a sensitive topic but you could imagine that for some groups it is very very sensitive uh, perhaps stigmatized too and that that the, the fact that you're doing your research in infertility on its own makes it difficult for people to take part. And if you've identified those as essential to your trial because they have a great deal to gain from a better treatment, then you really need to know, OK, those individuals are going to find it quite tricky because there's a bit of stigma um, associated with it in amongst that group of people. What, what are we going to do about it? So that'll be, that's what question two is about. Question three is, OK, the treatment itself, the thing we're doing, if it was a drug, say, are there things about that that might make it hard for some groups to take part or not? So it might be the uh, we might imagine vegans, for example, might be unwilling to take part in any study if they don't know what the packaging of a drug is made for. If it was surgery, there might be elements around surgery that makes make it difficult because of uh, our, the IVF example will lead on lead on to this as well. But the timing, if we have surgery before in vitro fertilization, that will delay in vitro fertilization by half a year, say that treatment surgery might then make it hard for people who, who don't want to delay their in vitro fertilization. We want to we need to know about that so that we can look for ways in which we can reduce it. And the last one, question four is, are there things about the trial design that make it hard for some people to be involved? Obvious examples here would be we want people to come in during working hours for measurements well, that's going to make it hard for anybody who works during the day and can't get off to go and give measurement. So you have in one design decision excluded a whole raft of people. You might be able to change that. Could you do it in the evening? Could you do it at the weekends, for example? Do you really need people to come in physically anyway? So by asking these questions and linking it to the groups who are very important to the trial, this is intended to help people think very carefully about how they can ensure that the people who must be in the trial can actually take part. And we have worksheets to help them answer those questions. And this is the one example I'm going to give before I come to my summary. And this is that in vitro fertilization trial that I mentioned a moment ago. This is bang up to date, so we haven't got money for this, but we have submitted it to that funder I mentioned, the National Institute for Health Research. And there are a range of questions on our worksheets and this is one about opportunity to participate to participate how does a person learn about the trial and that may itself depending on a range of things particularly who asks the questions would you like to take part in this trial there is the trial uh, that might influence the ability of some people to take part and one thing we found out already from our work with the include ethnicity framework was that for this particular topic south asian women were a key group so we did some work with South Asian women who had either had in vitro fertilization, fertilization or who were having it. There's colleagues in Bristol, in fact, who helped us with this. And through speaking with these women, what we found was that they would like the person who provides that information to them about the study to be a woman, which I expected. But they wanted that woman to not be South Asian. And that's because they were worried that their infertility which brings some stigma in, in their uh, group, might leak into the local South Asian population. So that other people in that community would then know that they had a problem with fertility. And that is a problem. So they, their suggestions was it needs to be a woman who is not South Asian. 
And that is not something I would have anticipated as a white Brit. So that enables us to suggest a change to the way we would like to introduce the idea of the study to women who are South Asian, something we wouldn't have thought about without these sorts of questions. And these worksheets ask lots of questions like that, where we can say, oh, we've got an issue. Let's see if we can change them. So summary, this is the last slide. So many groups in society have been poorly served by trials and indeed research more generally, and this can make it very hard to know whether this piece of research is relevant to them. So people like me, trial designers, really do need to think beyond the number of people in the trial. We need to think beyond the thousand and start thinking about, yes, but who has the most to gain from this piece of research? Who are they and what can we do to ensure that they can take part in the trial? So thank you very much for your attention. I'm hoping now that we can perhaps have some questions, if there are questions, of course. Hi, Sean. Thank you Hello. very much indeed for that very interesting presentation. We have had a couple of questions coming in. I think you may have covered some of these in your presentation, but it might be just good to have a little quick recap on that. The first one is, what are the primary reasons for people being forgotten or ignored? Uh, well, actually, I mean, it's a great question. So I personally think the primary reasons is primary reason is that literally researchers don't just don't think about it. They think about the thousand that we need a thousand people in our trial and we have these clinical criteria. Uh, so we might need diabetes. We need to have this sort of weight. We might uh, not have these sorts of conditions or these contraindications to the drug treatment, say. Um, so think about the clinical criteria and that's it. And then uh, assume wrongly in many cases, but assume that that means that their trial or their piece of research will then enable everybody who who meets the clinical criteria to take part in their trial and that that's enough. And what we have consistently found over the years is if you look to populations within trials, that they are very heavily dominated by the majority population. And again, I'm thinking again of uh, ethnicity. So here in the UK, we would tend to find that our populations uh, reflect the majority white population and we're missing groups who have a great deal to gain, but we're not thinking about them. We're not thinking about what we have to do to include them. So I think it is literally, uh, as it said, forgotten and ignored. They are either ignored, I like will just assume that it's all the same, or it, there isn't a conscious decision at all. They, they are literally forgotten. So that's what the INCLUDE initiative is hoping to do for many, many different groups is raise the awareness that actually you can't make that assumption. We need to explicitly think about, OK, well, if we want people who come from more socioeconomically disadvantaged groups to be in our trial, what do we have to do to make sure it is possible for them? Well, that um, follows on really onto the next question, which was what are the key steps um, to be taken when designing these trials? to ensure people whose needs are the greatest are not left out. And a follow up to that is how effective are some of these steps that are being taken? So I'll st start with the first question and then come on to the effective uh, one. So the first bit is to simply raise awareness that you, you trial teams, trialists need to think about these issues. So the INCLUDE initiative is really being pushed right now by the National Institute for Health Research and is also being picked up by other funders. So essentially they are forcing people to think about uh, these issues and particularly for things like uh, let's say uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups so one common problem is that there is a need to come in to let's say a hospital uh, for some measurements uh, or to provide some data uh, and there's a travel cost involved in that so we in our trial planning we might think well that's fine uh, we'll we'll just repay those travel costs uh, but you'd have to fill in a form and then you'd have to wait five or six weeks for the university to get around to paying you and what is problematic is that for some individuals in the more socioeconomically disadvantaged groups they can't wait that long they they, they, they need to uh, have their expenses paid immediately they, they, they don't have enough cash to spend 20 pounds say 
come to a centre and then wait for six weeks for it, then you need it now. And it's a failure on the trial design side to recognise that that will be an issue for individuals from that particular group, quite probably because most of the people who design trials are not within that group. And it's similar when it comes to uh, the ethnic makeup of trials. We assume everybody is like us and for a lot of reasons, the people who design trials in, here in the UK are largely like me, white Brits, not all, but many. And then we make assumptions that we shouldn't. So a key thing is to recognise that not everybody thinks the same way as we do and actively look and ask questions about how might it be different for these groups who we have identified as being central to our trial. So I guess many of you will uh, be aware that for many illnesses and conditions there are particular groups who bear the disproportionate burden of it and socioeconomically disadvantaged would be one of those groups. So we have to ensure that they are in our trial. So we have to look beyond the thousand to OK, and how many of the thousand are coming from the sorts of groups that we really, really want to help with this. So that's a bit on the, the, the problems. There are a whole raft of problems. So the travel one was just one example, but there are lots and lots of potential problems. Uh, language would be another if we think about how to involve uh, some individuals from some ethnic groups. But it's first it's asking the questions which will then throw up these problems. And the question about evaluation, how do we know it's working is very good. Uh, because right now, uh, I think it's uh, with things about the include initiative, very new. So we hope that asking these sorts of questions and providing these sorts of tools will lead to change, but we don't know that yet. So it's important that we start looking at, let's say, OK, here's the population of individuals who have something to gain in the community and, and directly comparing that to the population of individuals in the trials to see whether there's a match. And if there isn't, then we know that what we're trying to do is not working or not working well enough and we can try and improve and push it further. So I think that direct comparison, it's all very well saying use this, but we absolutely, as the questioner uh, suggests, need to evaluate whether we achieve it and we can look at the match between those populations as a starting point there, I think. Super, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've got a question here about inclusivity. Um, are we in danger of introducing too many variables in the trial, for example, age, sex, ethnicity and social economic disability, pregnancy, as you've already mentioned? Yes, <laughs> so cut to the, the quick of that. So I think uh, it's, it's always going to be tricky to look at a, a very long list of underserved groups and say right we want all of we're going to make efforts for all of these people to be in our trial now we, we would like to do that but um the reality is that we probably won't have the resources or indeed the skills uh, and experience to do it for all of those groups so what i anticipate happening and I, it has certainly happened in the trials uh, that we've been designing most recently is that we would think carefully about who needs to be in our trial and then identify groups who are central and yet are likely to have uh, been historically underserved. And so it might be in the ones we've been doing most recently, it would be, OK, we need to make efforts around socioeconomic disadvantage and ethnicity. And we'll do what we can for some other criteria in our case. Uh, so women often have been historically not involved in trials to the same extent. Now, the IVF trial women are at the focus of that one as were as they were at the last one I did. So uh, sometimes we, we would the area of the trial is already focusing on one of the underserved groups. But the questioner is absolutely right. I think it would be then very difficult to think, OK, we, we have another 14 groups and we're going to uh, do as be able to do as much work for all of them as we can for, let's say, socioeconomically disadvantages and ethnicity. So I think it's important to uh, prioritise which groups you absolutely must work on because they are so central to the group of individuals who could have something to benefit. And similarly, when it comes to the analysis and the tools we've talked about, or I've talked about, uh, do look at analysis too. Uh, we might want to do something with regard to enabling us to provide more meaningful information with regard to some groups. But again, it's unrealistic to imagine we'll, we'll run a trial where we could say 
something with equal confidence about all of these subgroups because it would make the trial very, very large. Um, so I think prioritization is what we have to do, recognizing which groups are essential for a particular condition and treatment and focusing on them. OK, thank you. Um, someone's asked about um, stigma around participating in trials. Um, and if you have experienced any um, anything like that, if you've approached ethnic minorities to participate, but they were not interested in participating or declined. Uh, yes, and I think it, but it goes like more general than uh, ethnic minorities. So I think there is often a tendency to to think of taking part in a trial as being a, well, a guinea pig is the phrase that many use, that you are putting yourself into a position uh, where you are now being experimented on. And that that goes beyond any particular ethnic group. It is fairly common to meet that. Uh, and indeed, the word trial uh, is problematic. Um, it sort of emphasizes that. So sometimes people will explicitly use the word study uh, because they, they feel it's less suggestive of an experiment. Um, but I think so it's a commonly held view. Uh, not only limited to one or other particular ethnic group, although there may be some groups that are more wary of it. Uh, and I, I'm certainly aware of mistrust amongst, for example, the uh, black and Caribbean communities for, for lots of reasons. But I think what our job as trial designers is to provide reassurance that actually you are not being uh, a, a guinea pig here. You're, you're we're clear about what the benefits potentially are and what the risks potentially are as well. And we were as clear as we can be uh, about what taking part in this study or trial involves, because that is a is a real issue. So the, the question is point is stigma about taking part in a trial a problem? It is. Um, and there are elements about the way we do trials, particularly the randomization element, which are problematic for many, many people. Uh, so we have to make sure that we think very carefully about how we will approach a person to introduce the idea of the trial, uh, who that person is who, who approaches to ask the questions and the information that that individual provides and how we make decisions about the information. Uh, primarily, we should involve in the design people who are like the people we would like to involve in the study. So I think to summarise there, yes, that stigma is an issue. It's, it's much more widespread than a particular ethnic group, although some ethnic groups have particular concerns. Uh, but I think we as trialists need to recognise that, yes, this is an issue and do what we can to uh, reassure people that taking part in this study is right for you as an individual. And of course, somebody might decide no, but it, we, we need to be as good as we can be in providing that information. COVID in a way has raised awareness of trials um, over the last year and that that has been uh, in some ways quite helpful. It's, it's, it's put these issues out there on it made them in the open. So it's not such a surprise to people if they were asked to be taking part in a trial, but we, we need to exercise uh, care and attention and the information provision. Thank you for that. Um, Teresa has asked a question. How long on average does a trial take from start to finish? Um, it depends, which is unsatisfactory, uh, I know, but years normally. So for the sorts of trials I do, which would be uh, trials which are intended to inform clinical practice. So they're generally quite big uh, and they're generally run uh, across many centres. Uh, that sort of study I would expect to be taking from from start where you think, right, this is the idea and then you're looking for money through to having the results that could easily be five years. Uh, with the actual trial itself, let's say taking two to three, but getting the money would take a good year or so and then doing the analysis and um, making that information available would take uh, an, up to another year or so, so maybe a bit less. But let's say five years, some take much longer. Uh, if the outcome, particularly say cancer trials, if what you're really interested in is long term uh, benefit on mortality, so you want fewer people to die, then you might be looking at 10 year data or potentially even further. Uh, and there's no speeding that up. Uh, you're just, just waiting. 
to know what happens to individuals at the 10 year point. So it does depend. Some other ones can be quite fast. So some of the COVID ones, uh, the outcomes have been delivered uh, within half half a year or so. Uh, and there are lots of um, research infrastructure pushing behind those trials to make them happen fast. But the outcomes, crucially, many of them were measured after one month. So they don't have to wait 10 years. You can get the outcome data after a month. So it does depend, but very common for it to be many years, three to five, I would say, probably being an average. OK, thank you. Um, I think you touched on this earlier, but someone's asked um, when, if ever, is it appropriate to pay participants in trials? And are there any guidelines governing that? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So, uh, so yes, it is possible. Uh, and I, I widely accepted that some reimbursement is appropriate. So all of the the, the direct expenses, travel expenses, yes, all of that just has to be paid. So you don't want anybody to be out of pocket. It's fairly common here in the UK to make a very small, uh, by which I'm thinking of something like 10 to 20 pounds payment as a as an appreciation of the value of that contribution. So that's pretty normal. Uh, some trials run by pharmaceutical companies, particularly the early, really early phase trials where uh, it might be the first time it's been put into a human, then those often carry larger payments. Um, well, we might question that, uh, but, but all of these studies will have been reviewed by an ethics committee. So a group of individuals unconnected with the trial team will have made a decision as to whether they thought this was appropriate or not. Uh, and there is some guidance from the National Institute for Health Research around uh, payments to research participants, particularly for those who are involved in the design, which is a, a really big thing that we do in the UK, and I think we're particularly good at it, uh, is involving members of the public and patients in the actual design of the study. And there's definitely pay, uh, guidance around that, um, amounts of money that we would expect to reimburse uh, those participants. Uh, you know, the amount it was usually, I think it's 25 pounds an hour-ish, then it depends on what they're doing, they might get more uh, for some activities. So again, to summarise, so yes, some payment is, I think, generally accepted to be appropriate uh, here in the UK for publicly funded trials, where it's a, a public funder like the National Institute for Health Research. Those payments are generally quite modest. So I think it, it's fair to say that if a trial team found themselves with the opportunity to provide participants with £200, each, I think that that would be considered more problematic uh, because it, it starts to seem to tip over into um, people taking part in the trial who otherwise wouldn't, but they do because of the, the money on offer. So some small token, yes, I think we all think that's fine, um, but not larger amounts here in the UK. But there are differences around the world in, in views to that. It just depends on the expectations. We've had a question regarding um, case studies. Um, are there any resources where we can read more case studies like the IVF example that you gave? Uh, yes, uh, so if you, so I have an initiative called Trial Forge, which is this thing behind me. So if you to put Trial Forge uh, into Google uh, or another search engine, then it would take you to that website and there's a heading there called include ethnicity framework, one of the menu items. So if you click on that, it will take you to more information about the framework. But as you scroll down, there are six uh, examples where we've we've actually filled out a complete include ethnicity framework for those trials. And it would show you the sorts of issues that the trial teams would need to think about, things that would make it easier or harder for particular ethnic groups to take part. So that would be a good place to get some uh, examples of trials and how their design and treatments etc would influence the ability of some ethnic groups to take part. Thank you. Um, ah, this, this question is um, for help for researchers. Could, could they have help in providing a fair um, random control trial for example where communication is an issue? Could interpreters assist? Yes, they could. Um, so interestingly, one of the issues that came up 
in that in vitro fertilization trial when we spoke uh, to the South Asian women uh, who'd had IVF or were having IVF, one of the points they raised is that for some women it would be useful to have inf information delivered in the native language, if you like. So Urdu was one language which was mentioned and, and interpreters were suggested and that person may not have to be physically there. So it could be a telephone uh, conversation, but it would be appreciated by some as an offer. It might not be taken up by very many, but having that offer. So in answer to the question, I think, yes, it would. Um, and in other areas, I think for, I keep going about COVID, but um, COVID affected, uh, as we all know, uh, people who are older disproportionately. And for some ethnic populations, the uh, language skills, the English language skills may uh, not have been uh, as good as they would need to be to understand the, the information about the trials they were being asked about, whereas providing that information in a range of other languages uh, and obviously including the ones that they would speak and read uh, would be helpful. Although that it's actually that in itself is a bit tricky as well. Um, the, the, it's not simply about uh, direct translation from one language into another, but the, the point you're making, the question is making is absolutely correct. Uh, what might be a barrier? language may be a barrier, what would help? And I think interpretation, not just written translation, is likely to be an important way of reducing those barriers for many trials where uh, different language groups, language speaking groups are required. Thanks again, Sean. That was um, really interesting. And I'm looking through the questions and I think you have covered all of those questions that have come in today from our participants. So thanks once again. Thank you, it's been great. And thanks for all the questions, really good questions.